Hi everyone, this is Mike Lewandowski coming to you today with another video. Uh, today we're gonna go we're going to continue our Bible study on 2 Peter. Let's begin in prayer, and then I have a couple of announcements. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so um, before we start, um, what I did at the last Bible study is I showed uh, a video, br brief seven-minute video, on um, a young man, actually a teenager, uh, Carlo Acutis from Milan. He died in 2006, and he's going to be declared a blessed in the church on October 10th. So that's actually um, this coming weekend. And to be, declared, to be declared a blessed in the church, that means you have to have some sort of uh, miracle that defies you know, all explanation. So scientists have to say, look, you know, this happened, but we have no explanation for why it did. So Carlo Acutis, just a very powerful story. So if you just go to Google Classroom, and you can find it on the main page, or if you go to Classwork, it's in there as well. You know, so when you get a chance, you know, I encourage you just to click on it, watch the seven-minute video. It's very inspiring. Okay. So let's just jump right in. Last time we talked about Second Peter. And we said that this was one of the, the disputed books of the Bible. So the church early on was not sure if they were going to include 2 Peter in the canon of the scriptures. But of course, they eventually did. And like I said last time, this attests to the fact that this attests to the fact that the church is a necessity. Um, you know, sometimes you'll run into um, Christians and they'll say, well, I don't need the church, I just have my Bible. But the problem is, remember, um, you know, what came first, the church or the Bible? Well, the church was established first. And it was the church that gave us our Bible in its present form. And this even includes the Old Testament because even the Jews, um, different groups of Jews were divided on what books made up the Old Testament canon. Okay, so this is very important thing to understand. So if we say we believe in the Bible, whether we realize it or not, we're saying that we believe in the authority of, of the church to decide what books should be in the Bible. Okay, so it wasn't clearly apparent that 2 Peter should be part of the canon, but eventually the church decided in its favor. So again, very important. The church gives birth to the Bible. The church gives birth to the scriptures in their present Okay, so let's jump right in to 2 Peter. Let's just do the salutation, the first couple verses. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours in the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Okay, so... The author identifies himself as Simon Peter. Okay, so clearly, he calls himself uh, an apostle. And this identification is what leads many scholars to believe. So they're, they're, there's a division, but that Simon Peter is indeed the author of this. And I believe I mentioned last time that St. Jerome said that possibly a different secretary uh, put this writing, um, you know, wrote this letter so to speak, wrote this out, but that would, it was indeed Simon Peter. Okay, so he calls himself a servant and an apostle, and he next refers to, he said, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours in righteousness. So, Peter boldly states that, um, that these believers, these Gentiles, most likely he's writing to the church in Asia Minor again, in present-day Turkey, um, that they are on equal footing in the faith, just like the apostles. So even though the apostles witnessed Christ, 
it's not as if these Gentile converts somehow get a lesser gift. Okay, they get less of Christ. Now, this is not saying that there isn't a hierarchy in the church. Of course there is. There, there's a governing body of the church with the bishops um, in communion with the Pope being on top. And then, of course, you have priests, you have religious communities, um, you know, all the way down to the local level, local leadership. And it should be working harmoniously as a body. So we're, we're not saying that there isn't a hierarchy, but that we're, what we're saying is just because I'm a member of the laity does not mean that somehow I am inhibited from, you know, becoming as holy as, say, you know, um, you know, St. John Paul II. It's not like because I wasn't a pope that I, I could never achieve that holiness. That's not true. I mean, in fact, some of the greatest saints, you know, were not popes, were not bishops. Some of them were, but some of them were just uh, either religious or lay people. So that's what Peter is trying to say. So God is abundantly pouring out his grace, his divine life, which allows us to live out the gospel on everyone. And Peter ends this salutation by saying that uh, by wishing the multiplication of grace and peace for the believer and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as Dr. Keating points out in his commentary, knowledge, we're not just talking about knowing about Jesus. Uh, we're talking about a, an intimacy with him. Now, I will say this. Sometimes today I encounter people who, when you say the word doctrine, it, it's almost like they run from it. Oh, doctrine. Oh, you know, that's it's so dry. It's doctrine. Well, well no. I mean, doctrine is extremely important because the more we understand about Christ, the church, the Virgin Mary, the saints, the more we understand about this, uh, it will deepen our, knowledge, deepen our knowledge. And if we allow it, it could be a catalyst to help us grow into deeper love. But we have to know things about God. So, Peter continues on in the next two verses, and there's some very important things here. He says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, that through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion and become partakers of of the divine nature. Okay, that, there's a lot there. So, first Peter states that God provides um, everything for believers that leads to a life of holiness, a life of godliness. Um, God calls believers to share in his glory. God calls believers to excellence. Uh, we are inherit, we are the the um, heirs of his promises. And God most especially calls us from the corruption of this world. Now, the world was created good. Genesis states that very clearly. But because of original sin, because of sin, there's, a, the, there's, a, there's corruption in this world. Okay? Okay. And, and we, we experience this. I mean, we, we, you know, obviously we see injustice um, in various things, but also this corruption of, we experience even with our own bodies. But here, Peter is focusing on the world. The world, basically those who live for the flesh. Those who just live for whatever desire comes into their head. Those who are living without any sort of reference to God. Okay, so God has provided abundantly for the believer so that we can escape this corruption because the world is like a sinking ship. It's going down. And because of sin, sin is like an anchor that weighs it down. Okay, without Christ, we cannot escape that catastrophe. We'll be swept up with the winds of the world. So that's what he's emphasizing. Now, here's 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 the the interesting point, or probably the most pop, you know uh, impactful point though here, is that he gives us the power to escape the corruption of the world, so that we may partake of God's divine nature. Okay, now let's think about that. So. 
how do we escape the corruption of the world? Are we just simply good people, try to be nice? Well, the problem is we still can't escape the corruption. Okay, we, we need a savior, right? But G Christ basically communicates his very life to us so that we share in God's divine nature. So that, that God, not that we become gods, not that we become divine. We're human. We'll always have a human nature. And God will always have a divine nature. And angels will always have an angelic nature. But we share we partake, we have communion with his divinity. And it's this that allows us, that gives us the, the strength, the ability to escape this corruption. Okay, there, there's no other way to escape this. So, and also, so in order to live out the gospel in this world, we need to share in God's divine nature, but also in order to be saved. Now, many times this will be kind of expressed as, you know, you must make sure you're in a state of grace, meaning you have no mortal sin on your soul, no grave sin on your soul. So we must partake of God's divine nature to live out the gospel and in order to ultimately be with God in heaven. Because salvation is can never come from our own doing, our own works. Okay? So, now, of course, once we receive this gift we have a share in God's divine nature, then we have to participate in it. Then we have to pray and do good works. But first comes that grace, that divine life, which literally God dwells within us. So this is so important. I, I think this is one of the main things missing today when we talk about uh, the necessity you know, to go to Mass for church is it's... I think there's there's a lot of people in, in just the Western world, in our culture, that have this false notion of self. I, I think they, they'll think, I haven't heard on the radio this morning, people just think they're they're good. Or, or people will make the right decisions, people will do the right things. Well, no, not always. Because, because of original sin, because of what the church calls the consequences of original sin, especially for baptized, we have concupiscence, we have this desire to constantly do what is evil, what is bad. Okay? So we need to, uh, you know, communicate to people that it's not, Christianity, you cannot reduce Christianity to rules, you know, which many people think, think it is, or that somehow you just have to simply be a nice person or a good person. Okay? Because if that were true, well, then Christ did not need to come. But he did need to come. And we do need to partake of his divine nature. Without that, we have no hope. And if we want to be saved, if we want to go to heaven, if we want to be with God for eternity, we have to um, obviously be in that state of grace, and then we have to actively live out that Christian life. I think if we explained it that way to people, I, I think it, it, would, it would hold... Um, at least hold their attention or give them something to think about. Because I think what we're doing is we don't want to, let's be honest, we don't want to talk about hell. Um, I do. I personally, personally I, have, I have no qualms about talking about hell because it exists and Christ talks about it many times and we, we should have a healthy fear of it and we should you know constantly examine our lives and our judgment. I mean, that's what the church has always encouraged us to do. But I think we're, we're so afraid, oh, if we talk about hell, oh, will they leave the parish? Will they not want to talk to us? Well, okay, I mean, so when we take that whole aspect of the, of the gospel message out and just essentially say be nice, be loving, be caring, it's not going to inspire people. I want to say, I, you know, I think it's St. Ignatius of Loyola, but I, I, could be, I could be wrong on this one. But I think he said, you know, I have preached so many sermons on heaven. And for the most part, it has very little effect on people. He goes, but when I preach a sermon on hell, wow. It affects people because it's scary. It's scary. You know, we have some commercials on, you know, TV, and they have that same sort of uh, um, messaging. You know, we'll have, uh, you know, anti-smoking commercials. So, you know, the commercial starts off, somebody's in a hospital, or, or somebody has, you know, a, a hole in their neck, and, and they're talking about how they thought they were so cool, they were a smoker. Well, these commercials are designed in a very specific way to scare you a little bit. 
to show you the consequences of going down that road. There's even a while back there was these um, aspirin commercials where you know somebody's just at the grocery store and they start having a heart attack and it's scary and you know they're 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 falling to the ground and then finally at the very end they're able to you know pop an aspirin and it's the thing that ultimately saved them. But notice what the what the marketer's doing. He's he's showing a very scary scenario, something that very well can happen. So I think in the church, not that we, we, we should just, you know, constantly, incessantly, you know, focus on hell. Obviously, we have to focus on Christ. But to, to eliminate its possibility or act like nobody goes there is, I, I think, it's, it's a disservice. And I think it shows because people do not then take the church seriously. The church is reduced to let's be nice instead of this is necessary for salvation. Okay, so this partaking of God's divine life is not something, oh, that's a nice idea, or that's a metaphor. No, I mean, God's life, his divinity literally needs to be flowing through us in order for us to even uh, function as a Christian in this world. Okay, verse 5 through 11, faith and virtue. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement, oh, I love this section, Supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, uh, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these things are yours and abound, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So for whoever lacks these things is blind and short-sighted, and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be the more zealous to confirm your call and election. For if you do this, you will never fall. So there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay. So there's a lot there. So Peter kind of gives this, this list. So he'll say, um, so we have to supplement our faith with virtue. Okay. So... Yes, we have to have faith, and faith is a supernatural gift. But this faith has to become incarnate. It, it, we have to become virtuous. We have to grow in virtue. Constantly assessing our lives, where what virtues we're lacking in. Are we lacking in prudence, temperance, justice, You know what we owe to God, what we owe to our neighbor? Are we lacking in fortitude, in, in courage, especially when talking about the faith? So we have to look at this. So our faith has to be supplemented with virtue. Virtue with knowledge. And again, this knowledge is this intimacy, this knowing Christ. And knowledge with self-control. So as we know Christ at a deeper level, we have to have self-control. We have to control our passions and our desires. This is essential <coughs> Excuse me for the Christian life. <coughs> Sorry, I got a tickle in my throat here. We have to have this self control. We have to have steadfastness or perseverance in order to have ultimately love, brotherly affection. <coughs> in order to, to live this way, our faith has to constantly be uh, moving. It has constantly has to be growing. And it has to be made manifest. This is so important. Nowhere at any time did anyone in the Catholic Church, you know, or was there a teaching in the Catholic Church that said, if I just accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I'm saved. Okay? Well, of course we have to, you know, acknowledge Christ as our Lord and Savior. We actually do that at baptism. But our faith has to, once we have that divine life, that grace, we're partaking of that divine nature, our faith has to be put into action, has to be made manifest. Okay? And we know we know this on stuff on a very human level. You know, everybody's been in that place at some point, whether an adult or as a child, where they say, oh, you know, but I love you or I'm your friend, or I care about you, and you'll say, but you never show it. You never show it. See, because we understand that's, 
that you can't just simply state something, oh, I love you, I care, but but then never manifest that love, care, or concern. I mean, we realize that on a, on a human level. So why would Christianity somehow take that away and all we simply have to do is have a, a belief, an intellectual belief in Christ? That, that doesn't make any sense. No, Christ, we have entered into a covenant with Christ. Okay? We have entered into a covenant with him. And that means we're entered into the family of God. And as a member of the family of God, there's a certain way we have to act. We have to, uh, in a sense, um, represent that name. We have to represent God once we are baptized. Because we are united to Christ, so and again, I'm not trying to be you know disparaging against uh, you know certain sects of Protestantism, but I think because I but I do think sometimes this this mentality creeps in to uh, the lives of certain Catholics, and, and it's just oh well, I just believe in Jesus, so I'm fine. But no, as Peter shows us, you need faith, you have you need virtue. You know, one of the biggest critics of Martin Luther was Thomas uh, Thomas um, More, St. Thomas More. And he was actually, initially, Henry VIII kind of uh, contracted him, so to speak, to to write and actively go and, you know, actively um, debate, argue with um, Martin Luther through, through the use of writing to put things out to the public to counter what Martin Luther was saying. And one of the biggest concerns about that Thomas had is that, okay, if we go down this this road of just, you know, basically what we would say today, accepting Jesus as my Lord and Savior and nothing else, he's like, well, what about growing in virtue? Thomas was very concerned about virtue and the need to grow um, in all areas of our life. And he said this kind of throws this out the window because ultimately it's not necessary. Yes, you know, uh, someone could say it's a good thing to have, you know, grow in these all these virtues, to be able to manifest these virtues, but ultimately it's not necessary. And Thomas said, you know, in, in essence, this would stop people from really growing and trying to excel in holiness. Because as Catholics, we know that if we don't reach that certain point, but we die in a state of grace, so we die in the state of God's friendship, um, we'll have to get to that point in the next life. That's what purgatory is for. So we don't, you don't get out of it. You, you have to be able to reach that level of holiness that God intended from the beginning. Okay. Now, Peter goes on. And he says, um, we talked about the virtues, self-control. Um, oh, and by the way, when Peter, just lastly, uh, I was looking at my notes, when Peter speaks of love, again, um, Many times when the New Testament is talking about love, it's not just talking about, oh, being nice. The word they're using is actually agape, which really refers to divine sacrificial love. So the, like the love that Christ had. Christ loved us so much that he went to the cross. So when the church is speaking about love, many, many times they're using the word, because it's in the Greek, in the New Testament, agape. So this, this sacrificial love, this, where we give of ourselves, where we forget ourselves and sacrifice our wants and needs for another. Okay. So, Peter, so after we have these virtues, we're living out our faith, Peter says that if these virtues abound in the believer, they keep the believer from being unfruitful and ineffective in the knowledge of Christ. Since, and I, and I wrote, since we're partakers of God's divine nature, there's no excuse for not bearing fruit. Okay, um, you know, uh, Peter, in fact, will say, if we do not bear fruit, then we have forgotten that we've been cleansed from our old sins. Okay, so the believer has a duty to be fruitful. And what do people do with fruit? They eat it. Okay, it's something that's nourishing, it's healthy. The believer is supposed to be um, a healthy member of society, meaning that through his life, through his belief, 
he is bringing true health, spiritual health, to those around him. And if we're not doing that, if we're being ineffective, well, then we're unfruitful and we're not living out the gospel. I mean, remember what Christ said in the Gospel of Matthew, so every sound tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears evil fruit. A sound tree cannot bear evil fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Then you will know them by their fruits. So, Christ makes it very clear. He says, you know, basically, if we're not bearing fruit, or if we're bearing bad fruit, sin, um, you know, then we, we could lose our soul. We could be condemned. We, we could end up in hell. You know, that's the result of bearing bad fruit. So Peter is, is emphasizing, taking, taking on the same um, image to say, hey, look, the believer must be fruitful in their life. You know, we look around and we'll say, oh, my goodness, the world is so messed up today. You know, every day we watch the news, at least I do, and I'm just like, come on, you know, what, what, what is going to happen next? It just feel like it feels like everything is unraveling. But ultimately, what we have to look at is the solution for the world that Christ established, that God Himself established, is not um, you know various governments. It's ultimately the Church, the Catholic Church, that is supposed to be this antidote to corruption, to death, to sin. Okay, and the members are the church militant. We're the foot soldiers. We're supposed to be bearing fruit. And I think part of the reason we're seeing the world um, uh, disintegrating, devolving, so to speak, so rapidly, so just um, uh, clearly, is that many Catholics are not bearing this fruit in the world. And as a result, the world needs this. And as a result... We're sliding back into a world of paganism. And so, again, it's not so much that we just need to, to shout our viewpoints out, but we really need to live out this faith. And our faith is controversial, and our faith, you know, persecution, suffering, that all, that's, all, that's all part of it. But the faith is life-giving to others. So if we want a better world, like if you ask the saints... They wouldn't start pointing around, you know, well, that person needs to change, that person needs to change. They understood, first and foremost, hey, it's me. You know, I just did a, a talk on, finished my th three-part talk on Teresa of Avila. The next part's actually coming out um, on October 15th, her feast day. Um, I mean, Teresa understood that she had to conquer herself. That that was the greatest battle that she would have to fight would be against herself. The enemy, so to speak, wasn't out there it was in here. So, and I think if we realize that, if we start growing in, 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 our, in virtue, self-control, we'll see changes. You know, we'll see changes in our own life, we'll see changes with the people around us, and then that will gradually ripple out to the world. But I think today, everybody's so just, that's wrong, he's wrong, she's wrong, they're wrong. Okay, that, they may be wrong, or, or that particular, you know, now we're in election time, a particular political candidate may be totally wrong. And there's nothing wrong with calling it out, but ultimately realizing if we want a better world, it has to start with us actively, um, obediently living out our faith. Okay, so Peter goes on, he ends this section by encouraging believers to be zealous. Um, and that they need to obviously embrace the gospel, and that God will richly provide for those um, who are embracing the gospel. And um, ultimately, if they're faithful, they will enter the kingdom. And um, Peter doesn't, you know, uh, one of the things Peter says here, um, confirm, be more zealous, confirm your call and election. If you do this, you will never fall. Well, <clears throat> What Peter probably means by that, according to Dr. Keating, is that not that you're never going to sin, but that if you're living this life, you're you're going to get back up. You're not going to remain permanently uh, fallen. St. Bede, the great, a doctor of the church, a Benedictine monk from England, wrote this about this passage. He said, Many are called, but few are chosen. The calling of those who come to faith is certain, but, uh, but those who consistently add good works... 
um, to the sacraments of faith which they have received are the ones who make their election certain in the eyes of those who observe them. The opposite is also true. For those who go back on their crimes after they have been called and who die in their sins, make it clear to everyone that they are damned. So Bede draws this distinction. Those who are actively living out their faith, trying to grow in their faith, we, we, there's this evidence that they will be saved. But those who go back on their faith and, and are not living it out, there's evidence that that's pointing to the fact that they are heading to uh, uh, for damnation. So Bede puts it very clearly and bluntly. Now, not that I should, you know, we should be saying, you know, you're saved, you're not saved, but again, our faith and our actions always go hand in hand. And so we constantly have to be vigilant with how we are living. And by the way, please, you know, um, for those of you who are watching, please, I'm not like preaching at you. I, I'm talking to myself as I'm saying these things. I'm like, oh my goodness, I need to do this. I need to change that. I need to be better at this. So uh, please don't, don't think like I'm thinking I got it all together because I, I don't. And um, I, I'm talking at you. So, okay. Uh, verses 12 through 15. Um Therefore, Peter says, I intend always to remind you of these things, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to arouse you by way of reminder. Since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. And I will see to it that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, Peter says that he knows that his departure is at hand. That's very interesting. Okay, he said, the Lord showed me what is going to happen. Now, Peter talks about his departure as putting off the body. Some translations will say putting off the tent. So he understands that death is not the end. And it's important to understand that Peter is will be martyred next to the Vatican Hill, right where the Basilica today is built. Um, on an upside-down cross because he expressed that he was not worthy to be crucified as his Savior. So that's how Peter will, will end his life. Okay. But it seems like he had this, Christ showed him that this was coming, this is how he would end everything. So he knows this is coming soon. So this letter is really a plea to them. And as we'll see in the uh, succeeding chapters, really to stay faithful, especially because there are, there, there are now false teachers within the church who are distorting the gospel. Okay, and, and by the way, the gospel of John kind of alludes to this death that Peter would face. John writes, um, has in writing his gospel, has Jesus saying this to Peter, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you fastened your own belt and walk where you would, you're where you would. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will fasten your belt for you and carry you where you do not wish to go. This he said to show by what death he was to glorify God. So John, I believe when he's um, uh, writing this gospel, it's after Peter's death. I'm 99% I'm positive just thinking about that. So John, though, knew... Um, you know, recorded that Christ told Peter this, you know, on that lake after the resurrection, how he was going to, that he was going to ultimately be, die a martyr's death. So this, this was, this was known to Peter. And then it seems like here in his letter, Peter has this other um, revelation, personal revelation of that his death is coming. Okay, and excuse me, let me grab this. And what does Bede say, St. Bede, on uh, writing on this? And I, I love quote, quoting the church fathers. I love seeing their insights to these things. St. Bede says, Peter has a wonderful way of describing his death. Not as the end, but as putting off of this earthly tent. Because going to be with the Lord is like coming home from a journey. And exchanging the tent for the comforts of home. The only home a believer has is in heaven. So again, Bede emphasizes that there's this... Um, Peter's description shows that death is not the end. And lastly, wrapping up um, this last little section, 16 through 21, Peter writes, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We heard his voice born from heaven, and we were with him on the holy mount. And we have the prophetic word made more sure. You will do well to pay attention to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by the impulse of man. The men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke uh, from God. Okay, so let's let's unpack this passage. So Peter first says, you know, look, we, we what we taught you, we're not teaching you myths or stories. This stuff really happened. And Keating believes, especially what he's focusing on here, as we'll see, the second coming. Because there seems to be this group of false teachers, this group who um, has kind of, they're in the church, but they're kind of not in the church at the same time. And it seems like they're denying the second coming of Christ. Um, so Peter declares that they are they were eyewitnesses um or that he was an eyewitness to Christ in his majesty on the mountain. So what's he talking about? He's talking about the event in the Gospels that's called the Transfiguration. Okay, the fourth luminous mystery of the Rosary, where Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to the top of the mountain. And here's what we read. Here's what happened. This is from Matthew's Gospel. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his garments became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is well that we are here. If you wish, I will make three booths, those are tents, here. One for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking, and behold, a bright cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Okay. So, at the Transfiguration, these three kind of, uh, the three apostles, these are kind of like the, the, the leaders. Peter's, of course, the chief apostle, but James and John are kind of like, uh, you know, the, the, the second in command, so to speak. Well, he leads them up the mountain, and he's transfigured, and they see Christ in his glory, and it's truly uh, magnificent. I mean, they fall to their face. So they truly see who he is. They have this, this vision of his glory. Okay, and of course, you know, we read Moses and Elijah are there as well, kind of pointing to him. Moses representing the, the law, Elijah representing the prophets. Then God speaks and says, this is my, the Father speaks, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. God said the same thing at Jesus' baptism. So, Peter say, look, we're not telling you guys myths. We witnessed this. We witnessed him in his glory. And I believe that what Dr. Gideon is showing us that the transfiguration um, ultimately foreshadows the second coming when Christ again will come in his glory. So you see these events um, Carrie, you know, obviously, like, you know, we could read the Transfiguration, and there's so many, uh, there's so many cool things we could, we could see in this. Um, you know, when, when I've done Bible study on the Gospels, we, we especially connect it to the Old Testament, like, why is Moses there, why is Elijah there? But you could also look forward, and Peter is saying, like, look, we witnessed this. We saw him in his glory, and this is pointing to uh, his second coming, when he will be seen by all in this glorious state. Um, and Peter uh, emphasizes that no prophecy, no um, no um, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no uh, prophecy ever came by the Apostle Man. Now, he, after talking about the Transfiguration, he kind of goes into this, and you might be saying, "Wait, well, where is he going with this?" Well. What he's doing is, first, if we read to a couple of verses up, he's, he's highlighting the authority of the scriptures and he's highlighted the authority of the apostles. And probably what's happening here is people are taking the scriptures, maybe not limited only to prophecy, but kind of taking the scriptures and again twisting them 
to suit their own purposes. He'll talk about this later on when people are taking letters of Paul and doing this. So what Peter's trying to say is, look, Scripture, which is one of the ways that God reveals himself to us, is not a matter for personal interpretation, okay? That there's an there's a authority over it, the church, that teaches us the right meaning. Now, we're not saying people can't have deeper insights, things like that. This is why we have theologians constantly, uh, you know, looking deeper into passages. But, you know, for example, you know, a theologian could see even deeper things in, let's say, the Last Supper, but they could never come to the conclusion that at the Last Supper, Jesus, you know, did not um, establish the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. Like, they can't. We know that for certain. But there could be also deeper things that, you know, maybe we, we, we haven't fully seen. Okay? So, the important thing Peter is saying is that Scripture, prophecy... This is for the church. They are the ones who interpret this and present this to believers. Because again, what's probably happening here, you have these false teachers, as he's going to talk about in the next chapters, and they're probably using different passages. And of course, they're using them to suit their own meanings, which people still do that today. Um, you know, they, they take the Bible and they, they twist it in different ways. And, and, and somehow it always agrees with what, exactly what they think. Instead of understanding, instead of receiving it, they're um, manipulating it. Okay? So, if Peter declares at the very end, he says um, that the promise of the, referring again to the second coming, is like a lamp in the darkness. Okay? So, <coughs> so this is this shiny lamp. That ultimately should be our ultimate hope. Look, no matter what happens, Christ is king and Christ will come again. That is permanent. Nothing here on earth is ultimately permanent and lasting. Okay. So we're going to stop there. Now you may be saying, wait a second, this is only like 45 minutes, Mike. Well, yes. So if you remember, I said the video, if you watch that video, the seven-minute video, on Carlo Kudis, it's, it's really good. We had a little discussion on that as well. And, of course, those of you who used to attend Bible study know there's a lot of questions. I love questions. So um, I know I kind of want to keep everybody on the same page. So um, next time we'll get into the false prophets of Chapter 2. But let's close with a quick prayer. And then um, I will see you next week. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without it. Amen. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, thank you guys. I will see you next week.